Welcome to the Ground Up Advanced Flight Simulation Tutorials. This series will take you from the very beginning of understanding flights and aviation, starting with the basics and working up to flying a jet liner with full procedures. If you have just stumbled upon this video, please check out the series introduction video by clicking on the link in the description box to give you an idea of what this is about. In this lesson, we will be wandering around the airport, learning about the various different markings on the runways and taxiways, as well as other signage, and then finally lighting around an airport. Before we get started, a couple of short points to note and a disclaimer. This series should only be used for flight simulation and is not a replacement for real flight training. At most, this can be used as a supplementary resource. And for those who are interested, there will be a Patreon-only Discord channel available in which you will be able to ask me any questions or request that I expand upon certain subjects. To join, please visit www.patreon.com slash ecgadget and select the Junior Academy Officer tier. You will also have access to extensive information for each lesson in a PDF document. For the first lesson, the PDF was available freely to everybody. Just look for the link in the description box for that. As of lesson two onwards, the PDF accompaniment is a Patreon exclusive. With that, it is time to get on with lesson three, airport marking, signage and lighting. For this lesson, we will not require our aircraft, nor will we need to refer to any knowledge of the previous lessons. The only prerequisite here is to know how a compass works. Also, depending on where you fly, the markings may be slightly different to the ones I show here in the UK. In addition to that, we will be looking at a precision approach runway, more on that in a later lesson, and the markings may vary somewhat from a non-precision and visual runway. However, I will explain all those marking differences and they are pretty easy to spot and realise. I will be using Heathrow Airport as an example using X-Plane 11. We will start on the runway. Taking a look at the end of this runway, you will see a section marked with yellow chevrons. This is called the blast pad. Not found at all airports or even on both sides of a runway, the blast pad is primarily there to prevent powerful jet engines from causing damage to the terrain around it, potentially weakening it and then causing movement to crack and damage the runway. In the case of an emergency landing, this section can also be used as extra landing space for an aeroplane and though it is not really strong enough to handle one, it is better than rolling onto wet grass or, in the worst case, water and potentially being in a more dangerous position. When used in that form, it is called an overrun area or stopway. Some airports will have larger blast pad areas, such as Kennedy Airport in the United States, and some, such as San Francisco Airport, will have specialized blast pads that will collapse intentionally when an aircraft runs into it to prevent the aircraft running into the water. The edges of the runway are marked with white lines that are thicker along the short edges. On a grass strip, you may not find this, but instead just find corner markings and little marks along the long edges of the runway instead of a solid white line. Next up on the runway are the vertical stripes that you see beyond the transverse thick white stripe that marks the start of the actual runway. These vertical stripes are called threshold markers and provide vital information about the width of the runway if they were painted after 2008. There are still some airports which may sport the old threshold markings of four vertical bars either side of the centre line of the runway with a large gap between the sets of four. The bars themselves are also quite thick which is how you will be able to tell if it is an older configuration. Most runways with these markings have been repainted to the new configuration which you can see here. As mentioned a moment ago, these will provide width information for the runway. Four stripes will indicate a width of 60 feet or 18 meters. Six stripes will be 75 feet or 23 meters. Eight stripes, such as the one at London City, will be 100 feet or 30 meters. Twelve stripes, like this one, 
will be 150 feet or 45 meters, and 16 stripes will indicate the widest possible runways at 200 feet or 60 meters. Non precision runways may or may not have threshold markings that match this pattern. Depending on the runway, a non precision runway will have markings in either of the two configurations, or a threshold marking with the runway designator in the middle. We will cover this in a moment. Runways can have a precision approach on one side and a non precision approach on the other. Cranfield Airport in Bedfordshire is a good example of this. Sometimes a runway threshold may have to be moved further up the runway. This could be for a temporary reason, such as construction work, or for a more permanent reason, such as noise abatement. When this happens, the free section of the runway will have some more marks on it to indicate the move of the threshold. If there are arrows in the middle of the section pointing up towards the threshold, we call this a displaced threshold. This area is able to be used by aeroplanes for manoeuvring and takeoff runs in the case of large aircraft, but is not designated for landing. In an emergency though, this area is still just about suitable. If the displaced threshold is temporary, you will also see little arrowheads across the width of the runway just before the edge markings and the threshold markings. An example of a displaced threshold is here, which is the other side of the runway we have been looking at. Occasionally, you will find that instead of the arrows going up the runway, you will have large X's. This means that the section of runway is unsuitable for aircraft at the present time. We call this the pre-threshold. A runway designator is the number that you see on pretty much every single runway around the world. This number is the magnetic heading of a runway as seen on a compass rounded to the nearest 5 degrees and then divided by 10. For example, this runway, 27, is actually at heading 271, but it could be anything between 266 and 275 degrees. The runway heading for the opposite direction is called the reciprocal. If your runway number is above 18, then you need to take away 18 to find that number. In this case, the reciprocal runway is runway 9. If the number is 18 or under, you can add 18 to it to find the reciprocal number. If there are parallel runways at an airport, they will be marked with a letter to help. L for left, R for right and C for centre. At London Heathrow, the runways are 27 left or 09 right and 27 right or 09 left. Along with the designator, runways will also have a centre line indicated. This will be a dashed line that starts at the threshold and goes all the way down the runway. As we practice takeoffs and landings, we will be trying to keep the aircraft on the center line at all times. Though it will not be a problem if we stray off in small aircraft, it is good practice for when you move up to a larger aircraft. The next set of bars that appear on this runway come in a few variations across the world. These are the touchdown zone distance markers and the aiming point. We will cover the aiming point first. This is the thick white bar, or staggered white bar, that is a short distance from the threshold. Painted on any instrument approach runway, whether precision or non-precision approaches, this is a visual marker that a pilot aims for when bringing an aircraft in to a landing. If the runway is a precision approach runway, it will be accompanied by additional lines, either as distance markers in the form of three stripes, two stripes and one stripe, or thin solid bars. These markers indicate the touchdown zone and are placed 150 meters or 500 feet from the threshold and then every 150 meters for a set distance, depending on the overall length of the runway. You want to have your wheels touch down within this zone, usually around the aiming point. You will notice that the ground here has a lot more rubber on it due to the fact that the pilots do that. At Heathrow, we have solid bars instead of the distance markers, but they are still the same in principle. There are five markers here, plus the aiming point, which is where a six marker would go. The number of markers tells a pilot what the length of the runway is. In this case, the markings tell us that the runway is over 2,400 meters long. Our runway is actually 3,350 meters long, or 11,000 feet. The last marker, 
being six of them in total, is at 900 meters. Since this runway has a precision approach from both sides, there are the same markings on the other side of the runway coming in the opposite direction. With that, you now have enough information to handle most runways on Earth. Time to move on to taxiways. To navigate around an airport to and from parking spots or stands, we need to use taxiways. These are similar to roads that you navigate cars from A to B and have names, junctions and stop points. Thankfully, they do not have names such as London Road or Heathrow Junction or anything like that. Instead, they use the phonetic alphabet to designate them with numbers if required. So, we will have Taxiway Alpha or Taxiway Mike 2. Sometimes, there may also be a link junction that connects areas together, a very small section that is too small to be an actual taxiway. Let's take a closer look at the markings and signs that we have on a taxiway. Starting with the yellow lines. The one in the middle of a taxiway is the centre line. In general, you want to keep your nose wheel following along this line. The lines will also indicate which direction you can turn your aircraft. In some cases, you can only go left or right or straight on. Though not used at all times, the edge of a taxiway is marked by a double yellow line, sometimes with perpendicular shoulder markings. This is usually when the taxiway edge is short of the edge of the paved area. You will see this a lot at Heathrow around the old runways where there is still concrete present. These markings are indicating that it is not suitable for an aircraft to be out beyond the defined edge as the ground may not be strong enough to take the forces or the section is just not permitted for aircraft. Where the taxiway edge is denoted by grass, you may not find these markings. The shoulder markings, perpendicular to the edge markings, are there to avoid confusion as to which side of the edge is the usable taxiway. Near a runway, you will also find one or two different markings on the ground. The first is a double yellow line that goes across a taxiway with a dashed double yellow line in front of it. This is a holding point for entering a runway. When you are instructed to hold short of the runway, this is where you should stop unless there is a second set of markings further back. The markings further back will be a widely spaced double yellow line, but in between the two lines there will be multiple double yellow line sets that are perpendicular to the main lines. This is the ILS critical area boundary. When aircraft are using instrument systems to land, this becomes the hold point, as it is a safe distance away from the runway as not to interfere with the radio navigation systems on the approaching aircraft. If a taxiway has these markings, the other hold markings in front of it become visual hold markings. If a pilot is flying in without the radio instruments, you may hold at the visual hold line. We will learn more about the ILS system in a later lesson. As you approach a runway hold point, you may also find the taxiway centre line changes to a single line with a dashed line either side of it. This is called an enhanced centre line and is just there to warn you that a hold is approaching. You will find these starting from 50 metres away and stopping at the hold itself. There are also intermediate hold points that you will find denoted with a dashed line across the taxiway. This is where you hold when air traffic control needs to give way to another aircraft that might be either pulling out in front of you, crossing or may just be priority traffic. Most of the time, you will find these just before taxiway intersections. Sometimes on a taxiway you may find a yellow X ahead of you. This is to mark off a closed taxiway or closed junction. Given the nature of Heathrow Airport, there are quite a few of these where taxiways cross the old runways. The next set of markings are also shown as signs on the side of the taxiways. The first one we will look at are the red markings and signs with the white writing. These are hold markings and are found at hold points around the runway and at intermediate holds on taxiways. The runway designation for the usable runway will be written down on the runway holds. For this runway, one side will have 27L and the other will have 09R. Towards the middle though, both will be written. So if you approach the runway from one side, it will say 09R-27L, but from the other side, it will say 
F-09R to indicate which runway side is where. It is like reading a compass that is on a table. If you look at it one way, you will see 27-9 or 270-90, but if you walk around the table and read it the other way, it will be 90-270. On the ground, you may also have runway ahead markings painted in the same colours. On the signs, you may also see CAT 1, slash 2, slash 3 signs. These are instrument holding points for the various categories of instrument landing. If the hold is for an intermediate taxiway hold, you will see the taxiway designation with a number on it for the hold point. The other markings and signs you will see are taxiway and stand related. These are either yellow with black writing or black with yellow writing. It is important not to get confused between the two and what they mean. A black background with yellow writing indicates a location marking. This is telling you where you currently are. So, if you see a sign with a black background and a yellow A, that means you are on taxiway alpha. The yellow background with black writing is directions for where you are going. These will normally have an arrow to indicate which taxiway is in which direction. You may also see other markings that are written in yellow, sometimes with black backgrounds, other times without. This is actually just for contrast, to be able to see the markings clearly. You will find these are at de-icing hold points or stand marks. Heathrow will use black background if the paving is concrete and no background if the paving is asphalt, as it is dark enough to see the yellow on it. It actually tends to do the same with all yellow marks. Even the taxiway centerline and hold markings, you will see a black outline around them to make them easier to spot. With that, we can now move on to airport lighting. This is useful for night operations or low visibility due to bad weather. As with the markings, different types of runways and taxiways will have different lighting, depending on what they are capable of, and some may have none at all, meaning that they are not suitable for certain types of operation. To start with, we will focus on the runway lights leading up to and onto the runway. Different types of runways will have different types of lights depending on what they are used for. In X-Plane 11 there are some errors in the lighting, but for the most part they are complete and correct. The first set of lights we will be looking at will be the threshold and end lights. For an aircraft coming into land, the threshold will be marked by a strip of green lighting across the runway. The opposite end of the runway will be marked with a strip of red lighting. Occasionally, you will have flashing white lights at the runway threshold, but this is not something that we generally have in the UK, though it is present here in the sim. Next up, we will take a look at the edge and centerline lighting. For runways with centerline lighting, you will have white lighting all the way down the edge of the runway. The centerline lighting will also be white all the way down until the last 900 meters or 3000 feet where it will change to alternating red and white. At 300 meters or 1000 feet before the end of the runway, it will change to all red. If you do not have centerline lighting on the runway, the edge lighting will indicate the distance to go. At 600 meters, 2000 feet before the end of the runway, or half the length, whichever is the lesser, the lights will change from white to yellow. This is also visible incorrectly on this runway. So, over here at Heathrow, the lights should all be white along the edge since we have centerline lighting. But, at somewhere such as London City Airport, where there is no centerline markings, the lights would turn yellow. If we have a displaced threshold, there will be a slight difference in the lighting you see. As you come into land, there will be four red lights on either side of a displaced threshold, followed by red lights along the long edges leading up to the green strip. This is to indicate that this area of a runway is not suitable for landing on, but it is part of the runway. From the perspective of a pilot taking off, it will look like a normal part of the runway in terms of the lighting. If there is a blast pad or stopway present, you will see a red box with a red strip indicating the end of the runway and then red lights marking the edges of the stopway. 
Lastly, we can have a look at the touchdown zone and approach lights. For precision approach runways, the touchdown zone lights will be strips of white light either side of the runway centerline, called barrettes. These will continue for 900 meters or 3000 feet, or halfway along the distance of the runway, whichever is shorter. The approach lights are usually the most familiar to people who have seen runways, as they are easy to spot even when you are not in the air, marked in many places with yellow light poles sticking out of the ground. These extend out a number of meters from the start of the runway, and are used to guide a pilot in by giving rough distance information and allowing the pilot to get perfectly onto the center line. A simple approach lighting system would start 500 meters from the runway threshold with a crossbar at 300 meters or 1000 feet. The crossbar is the line that goes perpendicular to your center line. The lighting systems are fairly similar around the world, but occasionally do have some differences. The Calvert approach lighting system is a commonly used one, albeit with some modifications in places. Calvert systems start at 900 meters or 3000 feet from a runway threshold and have crossbars every 500 feet or 150 meters. Each crossbar loses lights from either side, whilst the center lights also reduce from 3 to 2 to 1 for the last 300 meters or 1000 feet connecting to the runway center line lighting. At some airports, supplementary lighting is installed, meaning that for the last 300 meters or 1000 feet, there is a white barrette in the middle with two red barrettes, one on either side. This is what we see here, though again, I do not believe Heathrow has a supplementary lighting system installed. In the United States, you will also see sequential flashing lights that guide you in like a trail down the center line. These are called a running rabbit and are there to help bring the aircraft in safely. They are also used in places where the approach may not be straight in, but involves a bank on the approach itself. That is about it for runway lighting. There is the puppy indicator to still look at, but we will cover that when we are bringing an aircraft in for your first landing. With the runway lighting complete, we can focus on what is a far easier lighting system on the taxiways. Blue lights are used to mark the edge of the taxiway, whilst green lights are used to mark the center line of a taxiway. Where you see yellow lights, these are all related to the runway, with the exception being taxiway intersection lighting. If you are within the ILS critical area, the center line lights will alternate between yellow and green. If you are on the runway, and approaching a high speed exit, you will also have six yellow lights shown as countdown markers of 3, 2 and 1 light, 300, 200 and 100 meters from the exit respectively. You will then have the alternating green and yellow lights showing you how to get off the runway. At a hold point, you will see yellow wigwags. These are called runway guard lights and they are there warning you that you are close to a runway. They will either be on either side of a taxiway or in a strip across the taxiway if the taxiway is quite wide. This is something that has not been implemented, it seems, at Heathrow for X Plane 11, but we do have the wigwags on the side. You will also occasionally have a strip of yellow lights across the ground to mark a holding point onto the runway. This is again just for visibility purposes. You may also find a bar of red lights at airports where there is a lot of congestion or airports that are really large and busy. These are stop bars and they work in conjunction with directional taxiway lights. So if a stop bar is on, you must stop at it and you will find that beyond that, the taxiway centerline lights are not illuminated. When the stop bar goes out, you will find the lights are back on and they will guide you where you need to go. It is very useful when air traffic control needs to have very fine control over aircraft movements on the ground. That concludes the lesson on airport markings, signage and lighting. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel complete with the notification bell to see when the videos go up.
You can also support me on Patreon, as mentioned at the start of this video, at www.patreon.com slash ecgadget. Lastly, you can find me on social media at ecgadgetlp for both Twitter and Instagram. That is all from me, and I will see you in the next lesson.